Well, welcome to um, the International Institute for Strategic Studies. For those of you who don't know me, I'm um, Ben Marion. I'm the Institute's expert on land warfare, two and a half years out of the British Army, where I had the great privilege of serving with our speaker in the 20th Armoured Brigade in the mid-90s, where actually the uh, main British military preoccupation at the time was um, Bosnia. My last job, job in the Army, though, was doing... Um, the Army's final lessons learned exercise from the Iraq war. And um, one of the things that uh, struck me was that when you looked at it, there'd actually been some revolutionary developments in battlefield medicine and uh, also in the health care for the, for the wounded, and that much of the commentary on Iraq and Afghanistan had only covered this superficially. I mean, you, you just see the sort of Chinooks with a medical team in it, or the US Pedro helicopters, and there have been some features on um, the British-led hospital at Camp Bastion, but those are sort of snapshots of something that's been much bigger and um, more extensive. Uh, so when I went, bumped into our speaker, Brigadier Chris Parker, um, some time ago, I thought, well, actually, there is no one better qualified within the British military oh, to, come sure and, <laughs> to, come and t to come and talk about it. Um, and the other thing I have to say is I, I run a programme of events on land warfare here at the Institute in order to sort of promote understanding of land forces and land warfare so there can be more informed dialogue, which is part of the Institute's purpose, actually, in trying to reduce the risk of... Um, land wars worldwide. Um, so this is, this is part of this. Uh, we've got, um, as they say, few of us, we've got um, some refreshments, although some of the slides um, Brigadier Partners can show you may put you off your refreshments. That's why you're having lunch. In case you, in case you hadn't anticip in, anticipated that. Um, Chris is going to talk for about half an hour and his talk will be on the record, uh, but there's an issue of sort of uh, uh, specific details of, of real casualties, which, which he's better explaining than I. And then we'll have about half an hour's Q and A um, off the record. Chris, have I left anything important out? No, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. Over to you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm, I'm struck very much by the fact that we are in the International Institute of Strategic Studies, and yet what I'm really going to do is talk about an awful lot of tactical events. But I think it is when you put all of those tactical developments uh, together that it's created this, this remarkable um, success story in terms of casualty care, combat casualty care in particular. Um, but then at the end, maybe I can reflect on one or two thoughts of how that might impact on things for the future um, and maybe make one or two more sort of operational uh, or, or quasi-strategic reflections. Serving our nation, and I think that's something that we, we really have done in the medical services because I, d I think the developments that have occurred are of course going to be of benefit to the National Health Service and therefore the population at large. In fact, in Birmingham, you know, some of the people there have already benefited from the expertise that's been developed in the hospital there by having such, such uh, high levels of trauma and polytrauma going through. And I'll return to that at the end. But it's probably a good thing just to reflect on, on where we were. Um, I think pretty much all of us are going to be able to remember our corporate Falkland Islands. You know, in, those, in that conflict, the guys did amazingly well, but we couldn't get the casualties off the battlefield. It was not unusual for people to lie on the battlefield for six hours or more before we got them off. Uh, and that's, of course, a huge difference. We always were very proud, and are still very proud, of what the guys did at the Red and Green Life Machine in Ajax Bay. And, and their claim to fame, quite rightly, was that every casualty that got there survived. But in reality, probably there were guys who could have survived, but we just never got them there in time. Um, so, so you know, that's just a little bit of reflection on where we were. And as Ben put in the flyer for this event, we have to remember also the advances, huge advances, which people have made, particularly in the last ten years, in terms of vehicles and their armour and the protection that that, that affords our people and, it, uh, and they really have come on in leaps and bounds but also the combat body armour that we wear 
Although there's another side to that, of course. I mean, you know, I was out in Afghanistan last year, 12 and a half stone um, in, in the gym. I was asked when I was bored, before boarding one of the planes, would you mind just getting on there with all your body armour and a small day sack, ammunition, weapon, some water, at 19 and a half stone. And I wasn't carrying anything like the boys carry when they go out. I was talking to a trooper in the Household Cavalry. He was what Bill McLaren, the old rugby commentator, would have called a solid citizen. Um, and he went from 16 stone to 29 stone when he was carrying it. You know, that's a hell of a lot. So we're, the, the combat body armour undoubtedly works. And we see that um, in the pattern of injuries. So that many more of the injuries now, of course, are to the limbs. That's also caused partly by the IEDs. But the combat body armour and the Kevlar helmet uh, and, the, and the glasses, they do their job. There's no doubt about that. But it's made me also think, what of the future? Uh, you know, your mobility obviously suffers when you're carrying that amount. Uh, what if we go back to te- you know, the good old-fashioned style of war fighting or we'll have to do that? But what if we have to do it in an MBC environment? Because the burden of that load is thermal as well as weight. Things to reflect on. Everything came together really in terms of moving forward the tactical clinical doctrine when the defence professors got together and looked at what was causing the majority of deaths on the battlefield. We've known for some time that there have been three sort of peaks. The first initial peak, people who are perhaps killed instantly, completely bled to bits or decapitated or something dreadful like that. But some of those are going to be salvageable, and it's the ones who have huge hemorrhage. And it's hemorrhage, bleeding, that kills people very quickly on the battlefield. There was a later, um, smaller peak that was due to the effects of loss of blood, shock, and body systems shutting down. And then a longer, later, much lower peak, um, which happened when people uh, had succumbed to such extensive injuries that maybe body systems shut down. Um, how they succumb to infection. But it was the recognition that we could perhaps do something about hemorrhage, and in particular compressible hemorrhage. Uh, of course, the body armour, this is where the body armour comes in and helps with protecting the main cavities of the thorax and, and to a large extent the abdomen, where it's difficult to put pressure on something that's bleeding when they're bleeding internally. Um, but in the peripheries, people can very rapidly bleed to death, particularly when they've had limbs blown off. So, having realised that this was the problem, they then set about changing the tactical clinical doctrine. Many of you will have done first aid courses and always been taught the paradigm of A, B, C. So the priority is airway, then breathing, then circulation. It's no longer the case. In care under fire, it's C, A, B, C. The first C standing for catastrophic hemorrhage. So you deal with that first, particularly in the firefight. You can do it quickly using the new equipment that's been introduced. So the new equipment are things like a much improved first field dressing, which will hold itself in place because of the way it's designed. Um, a combat applica- application tourniquet with Velcro, which you can apply single-handed if you've lost the use of one limb, um, and gets such an incredible pressure on the limb that it will almost always stop the bleeding. Uh, but you can add another one. And compare that, the training and the ethos for this from from when I first joined, when we were almost actively discouraged from using them because people were worried about the the, the side effects of the tourniquet. These save lives. There's no doubt about it. And then advanced sort of dressings like this C-lock gauze because there will be certain parts of the body such as the groin and the armpit or the neck where it's very difficult to put a tourniquet. You don't want a tourniquet around your neck. But this is a, a material that you can pack in... T- uh, and hold down with the dressing, which actively encourages clotting to take place, thereby saving the casualty. So, boys in the field, not just the medics, but the infantiers, the combat support guys, the combat service support, everyone has been trained in these new techniques. And that's where the first important thing happens. In the first few minutes, guys are saving their mates' lives. You've still got a live casualty for the medic, the more professional medic, to get to. And they may bring some additional things along, here you see a, a, a much improved uh, chest strain. The two instruments on the bottom left are designed to uh, enable you to give fluids in through the bone intraosseous infusions. Um, a splint that's specifically designed for the pelvis. If you've got a major fractures of the pelvis, you lose a lot of blood internally. 
but this stabilizes it and allows you to transport the casualty and gives the casualty a chance. So again, things are actually happening out there on the ground which enable the casualty to survive that first insult. We've talked a lot, or there's been a lot in the press, about the MERT. The MERT, of course, is the British variation on picking up people with a helicopter. But in Afghanistan last year, where I was responsible for the whole theatre, we had over 100 aircraft dedicated to Medivac. Dedicated. But of course, the vast majority of those, about 90, were, were American. The balance came from the British, the French, the Germans, the Swedes, the Norwegians. So we were hugely reliant on the Americans for doing that dust-off capability. Uh, and that includes the Pedro uh, that Ben mentioned a few minutes ago. The Pedro be, being a, a capability where they have got very, very highly trained guys in the back, but not like on the MERT. These are, these are paramedics in the back of the Pedro who also do a lot of other military skills. But the MERT is different because it is led by a consultant. There's a, there's a paramedic on board, there's a nurse who's probably from intensive care or emergency medicine, and then the consultant that leads the team will have the right skills. They'll either be an intensi intensivist or, or an anaesthetist or an emergency medicine physician. So a consultant-led team, but what, when you think about it, what this is effectively doing is projecting the front door of the hospital to the point of wounding so that the casualty gets that high level of care from the moment they get there rather than having to wait until they actually get to the field hospital. The Americans also are blessed with so much in the way of resources, including manpower, that they're able to collect a huge amount of data on all the casualties. And all the casualties going through the hospitals in Afghanistan were monitored so that we could learn from the experiences and from the statistics. And when they first looked at it, it appeared that there was little difference between the survival of those who were evacuated by other assets and those which were evacuated by the MERT. Until you looked at the detail, and for those who are severely injured, and I'll show you mm. some, something we call injury severity figures a little later, they actually had a fourfold greater chance of survival on the MERT. So projecting this consultant-led team forward really works for the badly injured casualty, the one who's had several limbs blown off, that sort of thing. And then in the field hospitals, there have been, been differences. Um, you know that we have links back to the UK with telemedicine, the ability to reach back and get advice from, from colleagues if you need it. But the first thing I've noticed really is a cultural difference within the hospitals. When I was a junior hospital doctor, uh, rather like the real old days of Sir Lancelot's Lancelot Spratt. It was very obvious who was in charge in the operating theatre. It was the surgeon. It was his or her list. Usually it is. Um, and everyone was there in support. That's not what you see in a field hospital. It's a team effort. And actually the guy calling the shots is probably the, the, the anaesthetist because he's the one that's saying this casualty is only going to last another 10 or 15 minutes under anaesthetic. Do what you've got to do and then get out. And whether that's complete, completing the amputation of a mangled limb, packing the liver, tying off a major blood vessel, but you've still got a live casualty. So at each stage in this process, which is really dynamic, people are doing just the right thing to ensure that the guy stands the best chance of survival and moving on to the next echelon of care. In the field hospitals, they also have fantastic um, uh, protocols for use of blood transfusion. Massive transfusion protocols have been developed, again, which uh, practice which is being shared with the NHS. And the logistic chain which supports this has been remarkable because not only has all the blood flown out from the UK as it is from America and Germany, etc., for the other nations, but certain special uh, items such as platelets, which are the cells which help you with your clotting, have to be kept in a very narrow temperature range. They only last for about five or six days and they have to be agitated at all times. So there's a huge logistic uh, chain here. But knowing that that was vulnerable, We've also trained Defence Medical Service nurses to be able to take blood off people, off selected pre-screened volunteers in the field, so that we can get fresh platelets for transfusion into those casualties if we either exhaust our supplies or there is a, an, an interruption in, in the logistic chain. 
So lots of changes going on in the field hospitals, all designed to, as I say, deliver the casualties to the next level uh, of care. And, and those are the things I've talked about, but reinforced at the bottom by something called the Military Operational Surgical Training, which has been developed in conjunction with the Royal College of Surgeons, where people are put through their paces, the surgical teams are put through their paces in a very live sort of environment at the Royal College of Surgeons and supported by the hospital exercises at Strensel, run by two medical brigade, uh, whereby you can put a whole team, including the command and control of the field hospital, through some very real scenarios before they deploy. Uh, and this, again, was an area where it was a benefit when we started to combine some of the teams uh, and have um, surgical and anaesthetic and uh, medical colleagues from perhaps Denmark or America joining in and being part of the British Field Hospital and Bastion. So they went through that training side by side and it really prepared them for the deployed environment. So things like the MERT and things like the HOSPEX um, in, up in York have been seen by the Americans and they've taken this on board and are developing their own capability to mirror that. Here's an example of, of an Iraqi femur. Um, you can see that injury sustained by mortar, uh, mortar shrapnel. Very difficult to get pressure on it, impossible to get a tourniquet above there. But a young medic used the right sort of bandage to stem the bleeding. She survived, was delivered to the, to the uh, field hospital and went on to make a recovery. So it shows what a young soldier can do with the right training and the right equipment. And then the Royal Air Force do the most, most amazing job of flying these seriously injured casualties halfway around the world. Um, and in amongst them, there are unexpected survivors. There is no doubt about that. We've looked at, at, at these cases. We've recognised that under normal circumstances and had, had the cases reviewed by external people who, who've agreed that the, normally you would not expect these people with these levels of injury severity score to survive. Now, here are some of the inju injury severity scores. But what I really want to illustrate here is the difference between what we've been experiencing perhaps in the combat environment and what you might see in the NHS. So in the middle column in the NHS, you can see that over half of the, of the casualties that they might see with major trauma have an injury severity score of 16 to 24. Now, believe me, that, that's a high score. You are badly injured if you come into hospital with a score like that. But the sorts of scores of 36 to 75 are almost unheard of hardly ever seen in the NHS, but over half of our casualties in the deployed environment are in that range. In fact, looking at the other way, only a quarter um, have, uh, have uh, injury severity scores, which are more the norm in the NHS. So we're seeing really, really, really complex and challenging cases, and many of them are surviving. But it hasn't all been plain sailing. Around about 2007, there was a lot of criticism uh, of the care, particularly back in the UK when casualties came back. Um, and the problem wasn't so much what was being done clinically in Birmingham. This is one of our leading teaching hospitals. The clinical care was always very good, often excellent. What was lacking was that understanding of from where the casualties had come and what the boys and girls had been doing on operations for the weeks or months beforehand. And it was that lack of understanding and the fact that they'd suddenly and rapidly been dislocated from their normal source of support. Within the space of 24 to 48 hours, they found themselves in an NHS bed um, and a very strange environment. So they felt vulnerable when they had all these major injuries. So three things really helped to put that right. Just clear direction on the effect that needed to be delivered in Birmingham. An uplift in military staff in Birmingham because, of course, that meant that we had people that really understood the guys and what they'd been going through. Many of the military medical personnel had themselves deployed to all of these theatres. But gradually over time also, an improved understanding amongst our civilian counterparts who were working side by side with us and using their excellent clinical skills for the benefits of the casualties. Um, in terms of that direction, we talked about the patient being right at the centre but recognised also that he or she invariably by this stage was surrounded by another group of people, whether that was their spouse, their children, their parents, their partner in this day and age, there was a group of people that were hurting equally badly and really needed support in, in this journey. So we coined the term patient group to make sure that we recognised and included them and supported them from the military viewpoint down this pathway. We made sure that the clinical care, the admin support and the welfare were all integrated together 
and that was a function of the command there. Um, we also coined this term patient, uh, military bubble because sometimes, for very good reasons, a casualty needed to be on a bed, not perhaps in the military managed ward, but where their clinical needs were going to be best met, perhaps in the neurological intensive care unit or the cardiothoracic unit, actually in a different hospital. But because of the uplifting staff, we were then able to make sure that they were visited by the welfare staff, and visit, visited by one of our military nurses, visited by the, hospital, the military padre. In other words, we were able to throw a sort of virtual bubble around that patient group, even though they were in a different part of the hospital or a different part of Birmingham. So they felt supported by the military. The uplifting staff was an uplift in the aeromedical personnel who were coordinating the arrival of the casualties, um, an uplift in our welfare team, uh, we got military liaison officers from the, from the Royal Marines, from the infantry, from the RAF regiment. So guys who actually had a lot in common with the casualties. And they were a huge asset because sometimes the casualties or their families wouldn't want to bother the nurses because they were busy or they hadn't quite understood what the doctor <coughs> or the wound order at. But they'd tell the sergeant major who was wearing the same badges on and the same uniform as them. And of course, the sergeant majors would then let us know. So, you know, Billy doesn't really understand what's going on. If you know that, you can go back and you can and you can recover the situation. So these guys added real value. But probably the biggest impact, I have to say, came from the uplift in military nurses. And the Navy, Army, and Air Force were really good about reinforcing us with that because these men and women, as I say, had deployed. They want they joined because they wanted to look after soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen. They understood the environment from which they come. And, that, and they could relate to the guys that much better. But also we needed an uplift in staff because once people came off the intensive care unit and onto the ward with such high levels of injuries, this was really heavy nursing. You need more nurses to be able to look after people with that complexity of, in, of injury. So the staff uplift was very important and it was from those nurses that we found people who could go out each day and visit the outliers, again helping with that military bubble. But over time, our civilian counterparts really got to understand this and what a difference that made too. And some of them were remarkable in that, in that respect. Professor Sir Keith Porter actually went out to Iraq to visit the field hospital when we were still taking a lot, a lot of incoming in direct fire. But he went out and saw what we could do there at Roll 3 so that he could bring that understanding back to Roll 4 and share it with his civilian counterparts. Sister Erica Perkins used to um, run the intensive care unit at Selly Oak, now at the new hospital in Birmingham. She came up to me after a while. She said, I've looked after so many military casualties here. Why can't I do it in Afghanistan? So she did. We put her through pre-deployment pre training. She went out as a civilian. She spent four months in Afghanistan. And nothing gave me more pleasure than putting on her the Afghan campaign medal when she came back. So she really understood what we were about. This next slide I'm going to show you, I pinched from Sister Debbie Edwards, a remarkable lady, a consult nurse consultant in pain management from the Hospital Trust in Birmingham. She was talking to uh, the Royal College of Nurses, and I just happened to be there and listening. She was talking about pain and its management and the things that impact on pain. And she put up this next list. And I think the list, when you see it, shows a real understanding of our casualties. Grief as to what's happened to them. Anger, why me? Guilt, perhaps because their best mates have been killed in the incident. The exhaustion and stress, and stress and fear that they've been experiencing perhaps before the incident. Lack of sleep, etc. This is a civilian nurse practitioner who shows a real understanding of the combat environment. And we were helped in doing this again by the Navy, Army and the Air Force because they laid on a lot of visits for the civilian staff, whether that was spending a day at sea, um, whether it was going to the tactical aeromed wing where they could see what they do in terms of bringing casualties back from overseas, <coughs> uh, whether it was going on to Salisbury Plain to see the firepower demo and, and the staff college demo, and really starting to understand what it is that soldiers, sailors, and airmen do before they get injured. She added that, and she's so right. And we also invested in the infrastructure, uh, largely for the families. Uh, the Alex wing was an old nursing block, when I first saw it, it was really more like something old Salisbury Plain. There were just plain, plain bunks there with grey blankets, make them up yourself. Units came in, the chain of command came in, uh, and we were able to refurbish this and make a much better environment in which either casualties returning for outpatient appointments or families could be looked after. Uh, when you think about it, our people are dispersed all over the UK when they're back here. 
And so it's not simple just to go for an outpatient appointment, particularly if you're on crutches or in a wheelchair. You may have to travel the day before. You need somewhere to stay. You need somewhere to stay the night after. And we have a welfare team to look after them and their families there. The hospital gave us some flats. They refurbished the hospital flats. And then Safa came in and did the Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen bit to make it really nice. Mm. And I think that's really important because it showed that we valued our families too. And that's really, really important. Norton House... Um, uh, was a, a house that was bought by Safa in Birmingham uh, with help, uh, with assistance from Help for Heroes. It re- replicated the one they'd already created um, just near Headley Court in Surrey as uh, somewhere for families to stay. Um, and subsequently, the trust has produced something called Fisher House, which I'll show you presently. But again, you can see this was meant to be a home from home. It was probably as lovely a place as these people stayed in. But, but sadly, at a time uh, um, you know, that they never really wanted to experience, but they will be well looked after. And of course, over time, I think Birmingham has benefited from, and, and they will acknowledge this too, from the level of uh, polytrauma that has gone through there uh, and the experience they have developed in dealing with injuries, the likes of which, of course, have not been seen before, because those changes at Rule 1 uh, uh, and on the MERT and in the field hospital meant that casualties were surviving with injuries that had never previously got back to the home, home nation. And this is where I do give a health warning if anyone is sensitive, because I will show a few clinical slides uh, in the next dozen or so slides. Um, so just be warned, if you, if you really don't like, feel, feel free to look away. Wounds, of course, are hugely contaminated. You can see that just on someone who's just come into the field hospital. Uh, contaminated often in Afghanistan with unusual organisms. We had a real problem with fungal infections, but we quickly identified a protocol which took note of where they were injured, because it seemed to be people who'd suffered really major injuries and was, were injured in the green zone that were picking up these fungal spores that made it very difficult to treat the casualty further downstream. But identifying the ones who were at risk, we were able to start them on an antifungal regime, which made it easier in Birmingham to actually address the wounds in the longer term. That's a huge wound. You don't need to be medical to realise that that's going to put a great burden on the casualty just in terms of fluid uh, loss. Sorry, I've gone ahead slightly. In terms of fluid loss, in terms of trying to change dressings, and so on and so forth. Really, really challenging cases. And people have developed techniques in Birmingham to be able to deal with that sort of injury and deal with it successfully. I know that young man well. And he's gone on to, uh, to make a remarkable recovery. Obviously, he's going to suffer and, and have difficulties and challenges for the rest of his life, but he has pulled through. And I've enjoyed beers with him in various places around the world. Um, here's another patient. Um, there's a lot of technical detail there, but basically, uh, he was blown up in an IED. He suffered a cardiac arrest, and they opened his chest up before he actually got to the hospital to, to do cardiac massage. They had to open his belly. He had lots of bleeding inside. He got an open fracture of his thigh bone. He got an open fracture of his elbow. His back was fractured and unstable. And he had soft tissue damage. And vast injuries. This is one of these guys with those really high severity scores. But what I want you to take note of is the operating theatre history in Birmingham. 27 trips to the operating theatre. Six different specialties involved. 75 hours of surgery. And it's at this point that I want to reflect on the argument about military hospitals. Even now, a lot of people say to me, wouldn't it be good if we had military hospitals? And actually, I don't subscribe to that. And I'd like to explain why. When we first closed the military hospitals, yes, there was inevitably a a, a cost saving to be had by the fact that we no longer had to have a standing army in Germany. The Berlin Wall had collapsed. But actually, all of our military hospitals were too quiet. The throughput of patients was too low, the case mix was too small for our surgeons, anaesthetists, physicians, physios, radiographers, etc., to really get the skills and maintain the skills that they needed to be able to take out into the deployed environment. It made far more sense to put them into busy NHS hospitals where they could maintain those skills and then make sure that we gave them the additional military medical skills for those things that they would need in the deployed environment. So that was the rationale behind it. But there's another reason, which perhaps wasn't apparent at the beginning, but which I think is highly relevant, and that's that medicine has changed so much. And nowadays, people specialise and super-specialise. 
So actually, when you get a really complex casualty with many different body parts affected, the IEDs don't respect anatomical and physiological boundaries. So you need people with all sorts of skills to be able to come together. And that's what we have in a place like Birmingham, because they had 36 different clinical specialties, and we could draw on whichever ones we needed for the benefit of the patient. Here's another one, 11 trips to theatre, four different specialties, the longest surgical procedure, eight hours. You don't need to know the detail of what was being done, but I think the message is there. <coughs> and here are just a few slides showing you know, how one person can have an awful lot of injuries, soft tissue injuries, huge devastating injuries. But that slide in the centre was taken only six weeks after he got back, already looking forward to moving on to Headley Court uh, and, and, and rehabilitating. Here's a really, really difficult injury. If you lose your thumb, if you think about it, you can't actually grasp or pick things up. So someone's lost their left thumb. Here's a right thumb that is missing. Um, and then, again, here's someone with huge injuries, lost both legs, abdominal injury, scrotal injury. Actually, those last three slides were all the same patient. So you see the, the huge sort of damage which these things do. But these people come back and it's extremely difficult for them. They need an awful lot of support, but they show remarkable resilience. And it, it is truly humbling to look after them, truly humbling to visit them. And supported by their peers, that's when they then get on to realising that actually the future is moving on through Headley Court. They want to move down there. They want to start rehabilitating. They want to start taking control of the rest of their lives. And they get incredible support from their families. You see the, the bravery of the guys, but you see the dignity of the families as they support them through this process. Um, and, and some very touching scenes. Lots of other tactical things. The, 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 the Joint Theatre Casualty Coordination Conference, which is chaired each week from Birmingham, links the deployed field hospitals. It links in with PGHQ. It links in with Henry Court. So the whole continuum is looking at the casualties that are coming through and anticipating the requirements in the future uh, days and weeks. A twice-daily bunker meeting used to take place, as it was called, where they would actually plan the operating sessions in Birmingham for the next three days. But this is where the Birmingham people, the civilians in Birmingham, benefited, because they would get integrated into that list according to their clinical priorities. But they were then being operated on by teams that had phenomenal expertise because they were dealing with such, such difficult cases. The weekly military ward round was a, a, a revolution in the way that it was done. Actually, that's it shown on the right-hand side of the slide, where everyone got together first, all the different people, not, not just a small group going around the ward, but the physios, the pain team, uh, the consultant microbiologist from the lab, so that you could really discuss in detail what might be best for the patient, come to an idea of what you would propose, but when you went around the ward, then the consultant could actually talk to the patient rather than huddling around a trolley and looking at x-rays uh, and not having that patient engagement. And I think Birmingham truly is a, a centre of excellence now. But I won't, I won't deny it. The demands on the staff are huge, both civilian and military. Um, and in many ways, they would, they would often look at their tour in, Bast in Bastion as being their period of decompression. Because, of course, in Birmingham, it's relentless day after day, week after week, month after month during the campaign, we would have aircraft coming in. So if you're stuck with me, here we go. Casualties being uh, looked after in the field. The guys have done the right thing. You have a live casualty. The Merc goes out and picks him up with a consultant-led service into the field hospital. Um, change in attitude, damage control surgery as part of damage control resuscitation so that you're doing enough to keep the casualty alive so that the RAF can then do the strategic air of it a flying intensive care unit bringing people back to the UK, either via Bryce Norton or directly into Birmingham International where we got superb um, and still get superb uh, support from the, from the airport authorities. Help from the West Midlands Ambulance Trust and support from the police who provide blue light escorts so that you can get from the airport outside Birmingham into the new hospital in 17 minutes where the police bless them then line up the bikes and pr provide a guard of honour. Very touching stuff. The guy, the guys of the team goes on, bang, welcome to the NHS, you might say, because that's a West Midlands ambulance uh, uh, vehicle. 
But it's not so stark because, of course, the Aeromed crew, the RAF team that's looked after the casualty, go into the back of the ambulance and go right the way to the bedside and do a handover in the hospital in Birmingham. And we do use more than one hospital. We used to use Selly Oak, but now, of course, it's the, it's the one new Queen Elizabeth hospital. But if the casualty situation dictates with an eye injury, we'll take them to the city hospital. We'll go to Heartlands for infectious diseases cases. We might use the, the Royal Orthopaedic for spinal cases. But remember that military bubble and the military team that will go out and support the patient group so that they are looked after and they do feel supported by the military. The new hospital is quite remarkable. State of the art, the largest intensive care capability in Europe. We are definitely in the right place in being combined with them. And, and I always referred to it when visitors came, particularly senior officers such as admirals, generals, etc. I would say this is a joint and combined operation. Joint because we had members of all three services, Navy, Army and Air Force, and not just medical staff, but also administrative and sergeant majors, for, as I say, from, from, the, from the Marines or, or RAF regiment, providing this support. But joint and combined, not combined with a NATO partner, but combined with the NHS, and that's the model that it is. And this is the new Fisher House, which has just been opened, right on the doorstep, which adds to that Norton House that I showed you earlier. Um, done very much by the Trust Charity in conjunction with Help for Heroes and Fisher Houses themselves. The Fisher family uh, are, are a philanthropic family in America who have created these houses for their families by every single US military hospital. And we have one now in Birmingham as well. The generic ward plan allowed us on the military ward to do some adaptions. The ethos, I would argue, came from the staff because we had to stick to strict um, guidelines in terms of infection control. It would be great to put up lots of military memorabilia, but actually that just presents a hazard. But within that environment, with a military team, and with the civilian staff understanding the military requirements, the ethos was undoubtedly strong. We did early rehab within the facility, so even there in Birmingham, in anticipation of moving to Headley Court, we were starting rehab wherever it was possible. Um, there was a military patient's common room and a room set aside uh, to be able to talk to the relatives. That's the military patient's common room. It's gone on even from, from there. When I last visited, they, they'd improved it further. And then, of course, people are aiming to get to Headley Court, uh, which is where they do this biopsychosocial model of rehabilitation, ultimately trying to get people back to that point in the centre. And in actual fact, we mustn't forget that the majority of the work done in Headley Court is still looking after people who've been injured in training or road traffic accidents, and we're actually rehabilitating people to get them back to active duty. We've had to do, make a lot of additions to heavy court to cope with the casualty load from the current conflict, but they're still working to get other people back to full fitness. But Headley, of course, is a remarkable jewel in the crown, probably the best rehabilitation you will get, because there is nothing in the NHS that could possibly compare with what is done at Headley Court, and Headley Court is also backed up by the regional rehabilitation units throughout the UK and also the primary care rehabilitation units. So Defence has got a really, really strong rehabilitation capability and they've got strength in depth there. And then that's augmented, I would also add, um, by the Battleback Initiative. Uh, and you may have heard of this, whereby adaptive adventurous training is laid on for our casualties. So I personally can say, I've seen some of the guys perhaps at the lowest ebb in Birmingham when they're lying there trying to come to terms with the fact that they've lost a limb. I've seen them later in the months to come starting to regain control of their, of their lives at Headley Court. And then, fantastic for me and for them, I've seen them on the same ski slopes in France as their able-bodied comrades coming down the same slope, down the same racing piece, and I've had a beer with them in the bar in the evening. And the really nice thing there is that you meet the cheeky young trooper who joined the army some years before, but whose personality didn't reflect that when they were in Birmingham because it was such a hard time. But they've recovered that, and it's the combination of everything, I would argue, that allows them to do that. The human cost is significant, um, but I did just highlight there also, in the centre, the Afghan casualties. Last year in Afghanistan, um, Every, every week we would have a memorial service at the headquarters and read out the names of those that had been lost. In a bad week, across the coalition, that might be 20 names. Maybe half of them American, the rest made up from all the other nations. But then an Afghan uh, officer would step forward and say, we acknowledge the support of the international community. And this week we also remember 95 
members of the Afghan security forces who've been killed in action. They are taking a far harder um, casualty load than we are. And I mention that too because I just want to use this uh, as a prompt to say that my, part of my job in Afghanistan wasn't just to ensure the care of our casualties for the coalition and also their casualties, but it was to train the Afghan security forces' medical capability. Um, and that's something I just want to come back to on one of my last slides. Because that, that was our main effort, training them. I always reassured the chain of command that if we were ever worried about care of our own casualties, the main effort would immediately switch to that. Because I think you've seen we had a really good system that was running well. Um, and we needed to enable the, the Afghans to look after their people. But there is going to be a legacy from this. And, and the last uh, government and the current government are working hard to make sure that the NHS understands the, the load that we'll have uh, in, in the longer term with our veterans. There's nothing new here. This has always been the case. Long before I joined the armed forces, the NHS always looked after our veterans, and they continue to do so. But what's important is that we make, uh, make them aware of what that might entail, because, of course, very few people nowadays have actually served. National service went long ago, and so whilst there was a time in the decade or two after the Second World War when people had military experience or national uh, experience, they don't have it anymore. There may be some conditions of interest. NTBI, mild traumatic brain injury, concussion. But the Americans have majored on this. They have an interest in it because their they're American football players suffer with this as well. So they've taken a real interest in it in Afghanistan and they've set up uh, facilities where they keep people in theatre um, uh, and just look after them in a quiet uh, environment and give them a few days respite before they put them back into the field. Uh, what they're really trying to do is maintain as much combat power in theatre because they were evacuating a lot of people who'd been close to an IED but not apparently injured by it. Um, PTSD gets a lot of publicity and we know that in many cases people are not going to present with their PTSD until long after they've left the armed forces. So it's essential our colleagues in the NHS are alert to this um, uh, diagnosis and are on the lookout for it in the veterans. And we know also from studies by Kings that there's a lot of alcohol misuse in the armed forces, there's a lot of alcohol misuse in society, to be fair. And so it's perhaps not surprising, but it's, it's about 10%. Now, that's misuse. That doesn't mean alcoholism as such. It's misuse. But in combat veterans, it's as high as 15%. It's lower in our reservists, but higher in those who've been in combat. So we know that there are people who are vulnerable to some of these issues. And then finally, there's also the third sector. Um, and I, I, a number of the service charities will come up here, but of course there are hundreds of them. And again, this is part of the complete package, and there is nothing new here. It's several years now since SAFA celebrated its 125th anniversary. The Royal British Legion has been in existence for almost uh, a century. There's some of the regimental charities for much, much longer. But they all have a role to play. And this is the norm for us. And I, I, when I'm lecturing to other bodies, to other audiences, I always ask people to remember this and to support whichever charity they feel they can. Because they are injured from this campaign and their families are going to need support for a long time to come. So in conclusion, we have unexpected survivors. I think the joint and combined model in Birmingham is the right one. Uh, I've explained this, this patient group and military bubble, and I think that is a, an attitude. By the main effort was to focus on the patient group, and that gets away from the sort of problems that may have occurred um, in, in mid-staffs. You're, you're actually concentrating on the care of people and not worrying about the other factors. There will be a long tail. It is demanding, uh, but it's also a huge honour and very rewarding. But what about the medevac in future conflicts? Over 100 aircraft in, a, in Afghanistan, 90 of them provided by the Americans. The average time last year from getting the shout, the radio message that they wanted a medevac, to launching the aircraft, getting out there to a secured HLS, because they would only land when it was secured, and flying the casualty back to a surgical facility was 45 minutes. That's going to take some matching. Of course, in these campaigns, we haven't really been using our role one and importantly our any role two light manoeuvre facilities. So we have lost, I would argue, some of that experience. We're really going to have to concentrate on those echelons 
during contingency and training in the future? And what are expectation management in future conflicts if they're different from the sort of situation in which we found ourselves with a very established theatre where we've been able to provide really, really good care? And then finally, when I mentioned supporting the Afghans by helping to train their military medical services, it occurred to me right at the end of my tour that I'd inherited a very, very good plan from an American officer to help train them. And we got that going and I handed on to my successor. So we had continuity. But when I first gave it to the Afghans, th their reaction was almost one of, uh, of horror and shock. They clearly hadn't felt sufficiently engaged in the development of that plan. And when you think of the, the four tests of strategy as to whether it's feasible, acceptable, suitable or sustainable, we should have been talking to them. Feasible, I think we were in a position to judge whether we, what we thought was a plan was feasible, but whether it's acceptable to a completely different culture, that should have been their call. Equally, whether it was suitable, we should have been doing that with them. Sustainable in the long term, maybe that was our shout because the international community is funding this. But you take my point. So hopefully I've convinced you that we have been serving the nation, and I thank you for your attention. Thank mm -hmm. you.